All right, good morning. Uh, so thanks for everyone joining us today, learning about uh, total hip, total knee, total shoulder surgeries. And I'll be speaking about total knee replacement, specifically an area of ongoing research, uh, including cementless total knee replacement. I think it's pertinent here to state that I have no relevant financial conflict of interest. This is a newer technology, and so I think generally we should adopt these things carefully. So we'll begin with some background and history about total knee arthroplasty. So this is actually not a new procedure. The original knee replacements were actually described in the late 1800s in Germany. This was a pretty radical procedure. As you can see from the image to the top right, this was essentially a joint resection followed by a pretty rudimentary reconstruction with a artificial knee, which was a simple hinge joint. So this was made out of ivory and then cemented into place with plaster of Paris. So pretty rudimentary technology back then. What we consider more modern knee replacements began in the 1950s with various newer materials, notably the use of metals and plastics. And this became more of a resurfacing procedure rather than a joint resection. The standard knee replacement that we use today really had its origin in the 1970s with a total condylar prosthesis. We consider this the first modern knee replacement made out of metal and plastic, and it was cemented into place. It's the basis of all modern implants. And since then, there have been some improvements to geometry and design, better durability of the plastics, which is important, and better sizing and lateralities for patients. And this brings us to modern times. So this is a 2023 total knee replacement prosthesis. So we use modern materials with metal end caps, typically made of titanium, cobalt chromium, or ceramicized metal. And then the new cartilage or polyethylene cushion is a highly cross-linked high density plastic. So it has unique characteristics. It has high density and very low wear characteristics leading to high longevity. Modern knee replacement is a curative surgery for knee arthritis with very good results, rapid recovery, and very good longevity of the implants overall. And pertinent to our talk today, we have two methods of affixing the implants to the bone, either a cemented or a cementless option. So historically, as I mentioned, the femoral and tibial components were affixed to bone with bone cement, which is essentially a grout known as polymethyl methacrylate, or PMMA. And if you look at the uh, images at the bottom of the screen, you can see this looks somewhat familiar. This is something that looks similar to what you'd find in a hardware store. And in fact, this is what we use in the OR. So this is essentially a caulk gun or a grout gun, which we use. And it gives you some idea of what the actual properties of PMMA or cement is. If you look at the actual performance of this, if you look at the far left, we have bone preparation. So here we have the trapezoidal cuts of the distal femur preparation. We apply the coating of cement, which you see is white here, and it has the consistency of putty. Again, this is essentially grout. And as you can see, the surgeon is applying this with that cement gun. After that's done, we then place the final metal implants. And so we see that there are two interfaces that the cement will actually have with the knee as well as the implant. There's the implant to cement interface, which you can see here on the diagram, and then the cement to bone interface. And this is pretty important here to note that the way that the grout works is that it's not a glue, it is a grout. So the way that this works is that it has adhesion through penetration or interdigitation into the bone. And so highly porous bone that we see in patients with osteopenia or osteoporosis actually do better. They have higher penetration of the cement into the bone, whereas a patient with a higher or harder bone density actually has poorer penetration. So decreased strength of affixing the cement to the bone interface. And so this leads to possible areas of failure. As there's not a biological bond, we note that the strongest fixation of a bone cementing is actually at time zero. So that means when the patient leaves the OR, that is the strongest that bone bond will be at the entire lifespan of the implant, and it slowly degrades afterward with usage of the knee. And so this leads to concern for mechanical or aseptic loosening of the implant. And this can be worsened by a process known as osteolysis, which is a neutrophilic response to submicron particles of the plastic or of the cement. So why are total knee arthroplasties failing? So it's pretty clear now that this, gr this grout fixation is actually a pretty significant potential failure point. There have been numerous studies looking at the reasons for knee revisions. And over time, we found that aseptic loosening is a fairly significant contributor to this. Depending on the study, it's between mechanical failure or infection, number one, number two. 
And based on this study, which is fairly recent, they found that it was responsible for about a quarter of all knee revisions. And on the bottom right of the screen, you can see an example of what that looks like, a post-operative knee replacement, and then aseptic mechanical failure of the knee later on. So you can see basically how this happens. So again, there's no longer a biologic bond here. The implants can subside, and that can lead to bone loss and loss of mechanical stability of the implant requiring revision. So what is cementless knee replacement? So this relies on a biologic process known as bone ingrowth or ongrowth rather than the graft fixation. The surfaces of the metal are manufactured to actually appear similar in structure and stiffness as regular bone. And so when bone is put against the implant, it sees it like bone and will essentially grow into it. This is a process known as osseointegration. If you look at these implants under an electron microscope, you can see they're made to mimic the normal bony trabecula. So at the top right hand corner, you can see a fairly commonly used uh, porous metal called tantalum or trabecular metal. And then beneath it is normal trabecular bone. So as you can see, it is porous. It has crevices into it for which it looks sort of like bone to bone and encourages that ingrowth and ongrowth process. This is not really new technology, actually. This is primarily adapted from what we use pretty frequently in total hip replacement surgeries. So again, we have newer techniques and technologies, porous metal, we have roughened surfaces, and then hydroxyapatite coating, which is a calcium-like substance, which encourages, again, bone to graft or grow onto the metal pieces. Some newer iterative changes for knee replacement surgeries include 3D printing of the porous metal. This is perhaps the most important technology advance in terms of the development of these implants. Uh, improved geometry using a keel and pegs. Uh, decreased stiffness, which is actually better for this. So we like the stiffness of the implant to be close to bone to prevent a phenomenon known as stress shielding. And then a higher coefficient of friction, which is a fancy way of saying that they're very grippy to the bone. Possible benefits include a biologic bond, theoretically leading to a longer lasting implant. But there's a drawback here. Again, as Dr. Berliner mentioned, there's no free lunch. So here, it would be failure of osseointegration. So unlike bone cementation, where you have strong fixation at time zero, the moment you leave the OR, for a cementless implant, it has the weakest fixation at the moment you leave the OR, and then you rely on bone ingrowth to achieve long lasting durability. Last is higher implants costs. So this was a significant problem. It was only really up until recently with the uh, improved or decreased cost of 3D printing that these became essentially more commercially available for use in total knee replacements. So this is what this looks like on an x-ray. So at the left-hand side of the screen, you can see a standard cemented implant. So if you look at the interfaces here, again, you see the white metallic pieces. And then around the keel of the tibia, you see, oops, Way to go back. Oh, uh, you can see the uh, uh, the bone cement, which is radio opaque. So you can see this is a, a well performed cemented knee with a significant bone interdigitation, or sorry, cement interdigitation into the bone. And then on the right hand side, you can see examples of the cementless implants. Again, you do not see the bone or grout fixation with cement. Uh, and this brings us to some modern studies looking at this. I think the most important of these were ones that compared essentially looking just at the fixation type. So these were looking at within a manufacturer, looking at the same geometry of the implants. So you're not going to be confounded by different size or different shape of the implant, just the ingrowth surface. And this was a good study that looked at 400 cementless total knees matched one to one with a cemented cohort. Obviously, the patient groups are pretty similar. And they found a non-significant difference in overall rate of revision for these patients. If you look closely, it was slightly lower in the cementless group, 0.5%, compared to 2.5% in the aseptic failure group for cemented, but it was likely not adequately powered to show a difference. So we concluded it overall has similar rates of failure. Uh, this was a larger single institution study, this time comparing over 600 patients again to cemented total knees. Again, finding an equivalent rate of overall failure. Again, finding a non-significant trend toward superiority. But I think the sample sizes here were not large enough to really show a difference. And this data has been pre-borne out in the literature looking at short and medium-term studies. Looking both at retrospective studies and there are a few small randomized controlled trials. In general, finding no significant differences in aseptic failure for either group uh, or need for revision usually not finding superiority, 
And I think, that, again, the main limitation is that these are smaller studies, either single institution or small multi-center studies. So this, this brings us to something that we are using more frequently now, which is large joint registries to look at these issues. So this is the AJRR, uh, which is the United States Joint Registry created in 2009. It's the largest by annual volume, and they collect pertinent demographic and procedural and post-operative uh, information, which helps us to study these. This was a study looking at mid-trip performance of modern cementless total knees to a cemented implant. So you can see here the numbers here are very large. So over 28,000 cementless implants compared to over half a million cemented over hundreds of institutions. And they found here that there actually was a statistically significant difference with cementless survivorship at 60 months to be around 98.9% versus 98.4%. So perhaps not a significant difference in overall magnitude, but in this study, it did reach statistical significance. There is more data coming out about this. So these are some slides that were just released from the AJAR from 2022. I do think there'll be more studies coming out, but we'll just present these slides here because I think they are interesting. So again, they looked at revision rates over time, looking at cementless and cemented and something also known as hybrid, which is where you would use a cementless implant for the tibia, which is where we typically see failures and cementing the femur. So here we looked at males over 65 years. They found no significant difference in risk of revision, a slightly lower hazard ratio, but did not reach a significance. For women over 65 years, here the opposite finding, again, no statistically significant difference, but with a slightly higher hazard ratio. Males under 65 years had a statistically significant lower risk of revision. So it was meaningful, I think, clinically with a hazard ratio of 0.82, and a re statistical significance as well. And then women under 65, again, no significant difference in revision with a slightly lower hazard ratio. How about cost? So we did note that these implants are theoretically more expensive to manufacture, and some of that cost may be passed on to the medical system and to patients. There are a couple of studies looking at this, and they do find generally they are more expensive depending on the contracts that the hospital or facility has with the implant manufacturer, potentially up to several hundred dollars more. Uh, implants typically uniformly are more expensive with cementless implant, but on the counter, uh, you have decreased supply costs, so you're not using cement, you're not opening that cement gun, you're not opening the bone cement, and therefore there may be some associated cost savings as well. Um, I reached out to a colleague at the Kaiser Permanente, and from their data, they found it to be largely cost neutral, and it's largely depending on how you value OR time. So they found that patients that had a cementless knee had a slightly shorter surgery, you don't have to wait for that bone to harden, the bone cement to harden or cure, so it can be slightly faster surgery. And depending on how much you value that dollar per minute time in the OR, may be fairly cost neutral. Here at Greenwich Hospital, I looked at my own uh, patient logs here. So it does look, at least at our center, it is more expensive for cementless versus cemented implants. So this is from my own experience here. So some practical applications and conclusions. So I think some take-homes are these. You know, it's fairly clear now that mechanical loosening at the cement mantle is a leading cause of total knee arthroplasty failure. Achieving a biologic bond may improve longevity and therefore reduce revision rates, and this technology might provide a solution for that. These modern cementless knees are generally equivalent to cemented total knee replacements in regard to aseptic failure and overall revision rate, with an important caveat. These studies are short-term and mid-term data. We do not have enough long-term data to know their long-term effects. We assume that once they reach osseointegration, they remain stable over time, although that is an assumption. They can be relatively cost-neutral overall. To me, I think a selective approach may be appropriate here. So in a patient with, again, osteopenic bone, osteoporotic bone with poor bone quality, again, we know that in these patients, cement fixation does quite well and it has better interdigitation into the bone. So that may be a good approach for those patients. With younger patients with harder bone, cementless may be a good option. And so this is a pretty rudimentary sort of way to approach this. And I'll again say this, this is with a pretty significant caveat. This is with the available data as of November 2023. But this is how I approach it. I think at this point, it's fairly clear that in men under 65 or in patients with high bone density, a cementless implant works as well or is superior to cemented. 
However, in patients with medium bone quality, here we'll say men over 65 and some women under 65, it's equivocal. The studies show it could be better, but based on the best available data, we don't have significant data to support that. And then in the area to be more careful would be in patients with more osteopenic bone. Again, we know in those patients, cementing works very well, and we would advise caution for use of a cementless implant perhaps in those patients. Again, this is based on available data. Thank you.